Amen. Boy, what a blessing having Caprice with us tonight. Wow. Yeah. You know, Sally, Sally and I knew her when she was just a little bitty girl. And she's all grown up, and you're going on what? Number four now. Number four kids for you. Wow. God bless you. Wow. What a blessing. Uh, Pastor Nick, of course, uh, is in the Philippines. Uh, doing the outreaches with Pastor Dave Hinchy, as well as, um, oh, Jana. Jana Alira. That's right. In fact, I just saw pictures tonight. Oh, he's in the children's ministry. He showed me some pictures of uh, the concert they did. It was at a mall, a huge indoor mall, like three stories, and there were hundreds and hundreds of kids and people filling this mall, and Jenna and I were singing and dancing and telling them all about Jesus. It was amazing. So, uh, yeah, we miss Nick, but hey, we've got Caprice, so you know. <laughs> so keep praying for the work over there in the Philippines, and it is just a great blessing to see the pictures uh, from the outreach with Jenna and Lyra over there. Well, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30, shall we? Proverbs chapter 30. Now, as we come to the last two chapters in the book, uh, we should mention that scholars have a, a few different ideas uh, uh, regarding these chapters. Uh, take a look, if you would, at verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 30. In Proverbs 30, verse 1, it says, The words of Agur, the son of Jekah, his utterance, this man declared to Ithael, and Ithael to Ukal. Now, there's a couple of different views as to who Agur really is and what verse 1 is all about. Number one, view number one is that we have absolutely no idea who this guy is. <laughs> and we have no idea who his friends really are. That's view number one. View number two is that Agur is really Solomon. Because when we get to chapter 31, as the Lord wills, we'll see that some believe that King Lemuel, belonging to God, is actually Solomon. So they believe that, that Agur is also King Solomon. That's view number two. View number three is that Agur is one of Solomon, or one of Hezekiah's men. You recall from chapters 25 through chapter 29, we mentioned that the 13th king of Judah, Hezekiah, who was a good king and established a great reform in the southern kingdom of Judah, the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah, had had men who gathered the Proverbs of Solomon and copied them. And Agur sometimes could be looked at in light of being a gatherer. So some believe Agur is really one of the men who gathered the Proverbs from Solomon and subsequently copied them. Most conservative scholars believe view number one, that Agur is somebody we know absolutely nothing about. Now, while that may be true, what we do know is that chapter 30 can be divided into two very simple sections, and we've done that for our study today. So for you note-takers, you outliners, we're going to look at two things in light of chapter 30. Number one, first of all, we're going to look at his thoughts involving God. That's in verses 1 through 9. His thoughts involving God, and there are three of them. The first thought involves humility before God. That's in verses 2 through 4. Take a look. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 2, it says, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. Now, in beginning this first thought involving God, it involves his humility before God. Here the author understands who he, who he is in light of who God is. He realizes that he is nothing, he knows nothing, and he has nothing. You know, when we look at ourselves in light of other people, we look pretty good, amen? And when we have a tendency to look at ourselves in light of people who are really messed up, and we think, well, I'm not doing too bad. 
But he is looking at his self in light of God. And he realizes that he's approaching his knowledge of God from a place of humility. He knows his limitations as it pertains to his comparing himself to God and him finding out about God. Now, please don't misunderstand. I think we should learn all we can about God. And of course, we do that through the Word of God. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But if we think that somehow we're going to understand all there is to know about God, well, we're fooling ourselves. You know, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God said, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the heaven, uh, so uh, the heavens are above the earth, so too are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. In fact, Paul said in Romans eleven thirty four, he says, Who knows the mind of God? Who is his counselor? <laughs> oh, it's not us. So he approaches God in light of his humility before God. Now, he drives this point home in verse 4. Take a look. He says, asking a series of rhetorical questions, who has ascended into heaven or descended from heaven, we would say? Oh, that would be none of us. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Well, no human. Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you, if you know. In, in other words, <laughs> he's putting this whole thing together, dealing with his humility before God. In effect, he's saying, look, God is big. And there's a lot of things we can't fully comprehend about God. So the application is pretty simple. And that is, we don't know as much as we think we know. We're not as smart as we think we are. Hello? Now, a lot of us like to think we've got it going on. Like, if you have any issues, any problems, please come to me. I'll give you the answers. Hey, are you kidding me? We're not as smart as we think we are. We don't have it all figured out. We need to approach things in light of who God is, which means we are nothing. And that speaks of humility. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 1.27, Paul said that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty, the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Boy, that sure puts us in our place, does it not? He's chosen the weak, the foolish, the base, the nothing to accomplish. It. He's speaking of us, by the way. And the reason is found at the end of verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 1, so that no flesh can glory in his presence. Boy, that speaks of humility to be sure. Well, back to Proverbs chapter 30. Let's come to the second thing that's involved in his thoughts involving God. Number one, it involved humility before God. Number two, it involves the word of God. That's in verses 5 and 6. It involves the word of God. I like this. Uh, look at verse 5. In Proverbs 30, verse 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. God's word is pure. It's perfect. It's powerful, according to Hebrews 4.12. And we need to put our trust in the Lord, in the, God, in the Lord's word, because it, it will shield us. It will protect us. It will defend us. Man, God's word is is so important. We need to put our faith in the Lord and in the word of the Lord and not in man. Why? Well, because according to verse 2, man is stupid. I mean, that's what the Bible says. You say, Clark, I'm offended. <laughs> no, you're stupid. Uh, <laughs> I'm amazed at how many people put their trust in the most stupid ideas of man, but they refuse to put their trust in the Word of God. It's amazing to me. It just baffles my little brain. Well, look at verse 6. It goes on 
as a result of God's word being pure and perfect, and we should be putting our trust in as a result of that verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar. God's word is so pure, so perfect, don't add anything to it. Because if you do, there's consequences. Oh, that's what Jesus said, by the way, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. He said, don't add to the word of God and don't take away from the word of God because if you do, man, the plagues are going to be added unto you. Hey, this is a serious issue. And you know as well as I do that a lot of people, a lot of churches, a lot of denominations, a lot of different so-called religious groups have added to God's word and taken away from God's word. And the reason they do it is to fit their own sinful lifestyle. They want to continue to do what they want to do. So they rewrite the word of God to conform it to their ideology and to their life. But friends, the God's word is perfect. It is all we need. It is the word of God. It's life. It's light. And that's one reason why we place such great importance on teaching the entirety of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. You know, we talked a little bit about this on Sunday in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, how important it is we get the whole counsel of God, as Acts 20, 27 declares. Well, let's come to the third and final aspect of his thoughts involving God. Uh, number one, it involved humility before God. Number two, it involved the word of God. And number three, it involves prayer to God. Uh, that's in verses seven through nine. It involves prayer to God. And he prayed two things. Take a look at verse seven. It says, two things I request of you. Here's my prayer, God. Deprive me not before I die. Now, the first part of his prayer in verse 8 is to be honest. He says, remove falsehoods and lies far from me. Boy, a good prayer for all of us. Amen. Lord, I pray you help me to be honest. I pray that I would always speak the truth. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, by the power and might of your word, you would enable me and empower me never to lie. Now, this is an important issue for us today because it's pretty obvious that lying is part of the culture. I mean, let's face it, a lot of people lie just about everything, and they do it because they think, well, everybody else is doing it. I might as well, too. I mean, it's just the thing or they think, well, you know, nobody's really going to know. I can lie about this. I'll never get found out. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. And just because we think no one's going to find out about it doesn't mean they won't. In fact, they might not found, find out about it, but the truth of the matter is God will always know about it. Look, we're not hiding anything from God. <laughs> we can lie to our friends and family and coworkers they're not very bright, uh, but, but, but we're not lying to God. You know, Hebrews 4.13 says, there is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Proverbs uh, 15.3 says, the eyes of the Lord are, are everywhere. He sees the good and the evil. And what an important truth that is. Now, in addition to that, <laughs> I think we should probably take it one step further in dealing with lying. Because according to John chapter 8, verse 44, the Bible says that Satan's a liar. He's the father of lies. You know, I can't tell you how many times at the Bible college these kids ask me if it's okay to lie. And, and I, and so I'll pose it to the entire group. I'll say, what do you think? Is it okay to lie? And half of them will say yes. The other half, no. And then I'll bring them back to the book of Exodus and put to the book of Joshua and, and, and I'll talk about, you know, the midwives lying to Pharaoh and, you know, and, and um, uh, Rahab the harlot, she lied, God saved her. In fact, they're mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith hall of fame for goodness sakes. And they're going, wow, they lied and they're mentioned in the Bible in a favorable light. I said, now is it okay to lie? And all of them in unison, yes, you know. And uh, I mean, they got just little spongy little brains. You can talk them into just about anything, those college kids. And I'll, then, I'll, then I'll have them turn to John chapter 8, verse 44, and have one of them stand up and read it aloud. Oh, Satan's a liar. He's the father. Then I'll ask him, is it okay to lie? And they'll go, no. <laughs> it's the cutest thing ever. 
<laughs> Boy, now you can imagine what happens at secular colleges. God help us all. But no, we need to be men and women above reproach. We need to be men and women of integrity. And what a great prayer. Number one, to be honest. Number two, to be balanced. Look at the middle of verse 8. It says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food you prescribe for me, lest I be full, full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Boy, what a great prayer. Lord, help me to find the balance in my life of simply being okay with what I have. I, I don't want too much and I don't want too little because I can see the problems that can come about with both of them. And, and I think for us, the, the point here deals with balance. I was talking to a brother on the phone just today, just a dear brother, loves the Lord, wants to serve the Lord, thinking about starting this company. He's a young man with a young family. And, you know, that's a big deal to step out in faith and start your own business. And, 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 and so I was talking to him about it, and, and, but he wants to serve the Lord. And, he wants, and I said, look, I have found in my life that, it, that it's usually about balance. It's about balancing our service to our Lord and our, our love and service to our families and not neglecting either one, not being too heavy on one and too light on the other or vice versa. And I think we can probably all agree that most things in our life ultimately come down to somewhere in the middle of the road between the two extremes. And that's not only true with our possessions, but I, I think that's true in, in each and every aspect of our life. Boy, what a good prayer to be balanced. Well, back to Proverbs chapter 30. Let's come to the second and final section we want to look at. Uh, the first section involves his thoughts involving God. Now, this second section deals with his thoughts involving life. That's in verses 10 through 33, his thoughts involving life. And there are 10 of them. Some of them are singular thoughts. Some of them are put together in multiple thoughts and a singular thought, but with several different items involved. Now, the first thought involving life involves others. And you might not like this one. It involves others. Look at verse 10. It says, do not malign or accuse a servant to his master lest he curse you and you be found guilty. In other words, mind your own business. Everyone okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 says, to aspire to lead a quiet life and mind your own business. That's what the Bible says. You know, the other day, Sally and I were watching this YouTube uh, video of this young girl. Her and her dad were in the car. It was snowing. They were getting ready to leave. And the dad was in the front seat, buckled in. And the little girl, maybe three years old, in the back seat, cr climbed in her car seat and sat down with a big puffy jacket on. And, and she was trying to buckle it in. And, and, and the dad was letting her. And, she, you know, a little a couple seconds went by. And he goes, honey, do you want me to help you? She said, no, thank you. And she's working at it. And then, well, honey, are you sure you... No, I can do it. And she's working at it and struggling and really focused. You can see it. And then he finally says, let me come back and help you. And she goes, you worry about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you worry about yourself. Don't worry about me. I, you, you know what I mean? You, you mind your own business. And it was the cutest thing ever because she was bound into turn. Look, the point is... I don't know about y'all, but I got enough things in my life to worry about and deal with without worrying about everybody else and what they've got going on. You know what I mean? I mean, just mind your own business. Number two, <laughs> the, the second thing deals with evil generations in verses 11 through 14. Evil generations. And he mentions four things about that. The first thing involves disrespect in verse 11. It says, there is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. That's disrespect. That's one thing that characterizes an evil generation. No respect for father or mother. You know, that's the opposite of what Jesus says in Matthew 19, 19. We're to honor our father and our mother and not give them grief. <laughs> and all the parents say. Number two, this... <laughs> 
The second thing about evil generations involves self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. Look at verse 12. It says, there is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. Well, there's a lot of people today who think they're, what they're doing is right. They justify their actions, and, and it, they're self-righteous. But for you and me, we don't gauge our actions on what we think or what we feel or what popular opinion poll may proclaim. No, we gauge everything we say and everything we do from the Word of God. It's, it's the Bible that dictates our lives as it pertains to what we do and how we live. Number three, the third aspect of an evil generation involves pride. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. It speaks of pride. And their eyelids are lifted up, or arrogant, we might say. So pride and arrogance, man, the two things that God resists. You know, in 1 Peter 5.5 5 and James 4.6, it says, God resists the proud. And this is an important lesson for all of us, because it is very easy for us to become prideful. Maybe in our jobs, in our careers, we get pretty good at things after a while and we think that somehow we've arrived and everybody else needs to bow down to us. Or maybe spiritual pride, thinking that somehow we've got it all together and we know what God's Word says and brother, come let me straighten you out kind of a thing. Hey, we all need to be careful and guard against pride. Number four and finally, the fourth thing about this evil generation involves cruelty. Cruelty, look at verse 14. It says, there is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Cruelty to others. Man, these are things we need to really guard against in our generation. We need to be just the opposite. Uh, we not only need to be doing that which is good, we need to be setting an example of that which is good because whether we like it or not, whether we know it, believe it or not, other people are watching us. And as we proclaim to be Christians, people look at what we say, how we act, where we go, and the things we do. And they might not even acknowledge that to us, but they're there and they see us. So the question is not... <laughs> Are we setting an example for somebody? Because we are, whether we know it or not. The real question is, what kind of an example are we setting for others? You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Man, he set the example for all of us of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Well, number three. Uh, the, the third thing involves things that are never satisfied. Things that are never satisfied. That's in verses 15 and 16. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 15, it says, The leech has two daughters crying, Give, give. So there's the two daughters. In other words, they're twin daughters. The leech is never satisfied. They're always crying out, Give me more, give me more. And, and then this is illustrated or amplified by a few more examples in, in verses 15 through 16. The first example, um, well, oh, look, at, look at the end of verse 15, excuse me. It says there are three things that are never satisfied. Four things never say it is enough. Now in verse 16, he gives us the examples. Number one is the grave. The grave is never satisfied because people are always dying. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto man once to die. So the grave is never satisfied. Number two is the barren womb. The barren womb is always desirous of children. The third is the earth that is not satisfied with water. Look, it can rain, uh, but there's parts of the earth that are never satisfied. They don't get the water. And then the last is fire in verse 16. And the fire that never says it is enough. It's constantly seeking out fuel to burn, we would say. And this whole topic deals with and speaks of greed. Always wanting more. Never being satisfied. Now as believers, as Christians... We understand that 
the things of this world can never really satisfy us. They can never really bring contentment in our life because we'll always want more. It'll never be enough. We understand that our contentment is not in our possessions. Our contentment's not even in a place. Our contentment's in a person. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. And only in, through, and because of Christ can we ever be content. And it's something we learn, by the way, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul said, not that I uh, speak to need, for I have learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. In verse 12, he goes on to say, I've learned to be empty. I've learned to be full. Uh, I've learned to be content when I've got nothing at all, when I have everything at all. Because he understood in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 4 that my God shall provide all your need according to his riches and glory. So for you and I, contentment is found in Christ. Well, back in Proverbs chapter 30, let's come to the fourth aspect of his thoughts involving life, and that involves parents. Number four, it involves parents in verse 17. It says, the eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. Now, we saw we were to honor our parents in the previous section. Here, we're to obey our parents. Uh, that's what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 1, by the way. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Because if we don't, according to verse 17, there's consequences. Their eyes are going to be plucked out and eaten by the ravens and the young eagles. In other words, look, this is an important issue to honor and obey our parents. In fact, it's the, out of the Ten Commandments back in Exodus chapter 20, it is the only commandment with a blessing that follows. If you obey your commandment, uh, your parents, your life will be long on the earth. So it's the only one with a promise. Kind of interesting. Number five. Now, the fifth thing involves a lack of understanding, a lack of understanding. Uh, that's in verses 18 and 19. Uh, take a look at verse 18 for a moment. It says, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, four which I do not understand. And he lists four things he doesn't understand in verse 19. Number one is the eagle. It says the way of an eagle in the air. Now the eagle soars through the air without leaving a trace. You can't follow the path of an eagle because it doesn't leave a trail behind it. There, it leaves no trace. Number two is the serpent. It says the way of a serpent on a rock. Now when a serpent travels on sand, it leaves a trail. You can trace it. But if it's traveling on a rock, it leaves no trace. You can't follow. It leaves no trail behind. The third, verse 19, is a ship. It says the way of a ship in the midst or in the heart of the sea. So as a ship sails through the sea, it, it doesn't leave a trail. It doesn't leave a trace. Oh, there's a little wake, but it's short-lived. And then the, the middle of the sea uh, covers it up, and you have no idea that a ship ever sailed that way. And the fourth is the man, verse 19. It says the way of a man with a virgin. So it deals with a man who desires a virgin and will subsequently do things that cannot be traced to have his way with the virgin. He's not going to leave a trail, we might say. And I think in this, the whole point deals with others' understanding. There are a lot of things in this life we don't understand because we can't see it. It doesn't leave a trail. It leaves no trace behind. So we can't fully comprehend it. There are things we might be able to apprehend because the Bible teaches it and we believe it, but we can't fully comprehend it. You say, okay, Clark, if that's the case, what's the point? Well, I think the point is, since there's a lot of things we can't fully understand, it means you and I have to do something different. It means we... <laughs> have to walk by faith. You know, I hate that. I would just as soon know where I'm. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the Bible says that we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, I just as soon see where I'm going. 
I'd just as soon know the path that I was going to take. I would just as soon like to see the trail that I want to follow in life. But you know, God doesn't always work that way, does He? <laughs> Sometimes He doesn't give us a trail to follow. Sometimes there's no path to walk down. Sometimes, like the children of Israel in the book of Joshua, you got to step your one foot into the water and wait to see if it's going to part. You know, God told the children of Israel to enter the promised land. But it was storm season. It was flood season. The river Jordan was raging. Now, when we go to Israel, it's rarely raging. It, it's just a little, a little stream. You think, oh, that's nothing. Uh, but look, at flood time, it could be going big time. God said, enter the promised land. They didn't say, well, how are we going to cross the river, Lord? <laughs> they didn't say that. They walked by faith. The priest grabbed the ark and said, let's go. By faith, they put their foot in the water, and it was only then did the river Jordan part, and they crossed on dry land. And so too, gang, is it is with us. Look, I don't always know God's plan. I, I'm not always sure what he has in store for us. And, and sometimes I don't even think it's about getting to point B from point A. I think sometimes it's just, are we going to actually step out in faith and do it? Well, let's come to a sixth matter. We have to hurry. And that involves a hard heart, a hard heart. Look at verse 20. It says, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness. So being an adulteress is, a, is as common as eating and wiping your mouth. In other words, she has no problem with the sin she's in. And I guess the application for us is pretty powerful. Look, if we sin knowingly, willfully, and it really doesn't bother us, we have no problem with it, it doesn't affect us in a negative way, boy, we better check our heart. We probably have a hard heart toward God. We might not even be saved. You know, John 16, 8 says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And if we're not experiencing the conviction of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts, we might need to check our heart. Chances are we've got a hard heart. Number seven. The seventh issue deals with things that bring down a society. That's in verses 21 through 23. Things that bring down a society. Uh, take a look at verse 21. Proverbs 30, verse 21, it says, for three things the earth is perturbed. Yes, for four it cannot bear up. It brings it down. It, it brings down society. The first involves a servant when he reigns, in verse 22. A servant when he reigns. Someone who is ruling and reigning who has no experience, we might say. The second involves a fool filled with food. In the middle of verse 22, it says a fool when he is filled with food. When a fool has great possessions, it doesn't do anybody any good because he's so foolish. The third involves a hateful woman. Look at verse 23. It says a hateful woman when she is married. Now, it's bad enough to, to know a hateful woman. It's obviously worse to be married to one. Not that I would know, but I mean, you know, other people probably have this issue. Number four, here's something else that brings down a society, a maidservant who succeeds her mistress. Look at the end of verse 23. It says, and a maidservant who succeeds her mistress. In other words, a servant who seduces her master will succeed her mistress and inherit the spoils. Look, these are a few things that we should generally guard against in society as a whole, obviously, he's talking about the earth, bringing it down. But, but the personal application is uh, incredibly important for us, obviously. Number eight. Let's come to the eighth thing. We said there were only ten. <laughs> the eighth thing deals with things that are little but wise. Things that are little but wise. That's in verses 24 through 28. Uh, take a look at verse 24. It says, there are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. Number one, the first thing is the ant in verse 25. It says, the ant are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. Now, obviously, ants 
on their own level are very strong. They can lift 20 times their own body weight. They're infinitely stronger than us, proportionally speaking. In fact, if we could run as fast as ants can, can proportionally, we'd run as fast as a racehorse. But clearly, they're not strong compared to us. Follow me? So he says, Ant, ants are a people that are not strong, I mean, compared to humans. However, they're really smart because they prepare their food in the summer. They're very wise. They work together as a team. You guys have seen ants work. They all work together. They collect food in the summer. They know they can't swim. I mean, if the rains come, they just wash away, <laughs> you stupid little ants. I hate ants. But they're so smart. They work together. They gather food in the summer because they know that the rain will just wash them away. Boy, what a great example for us to work together as the body of Christ. To gather together, to store up treasures. Oh, not on earth. Matthew 6, 19, where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But storing up treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal, because where our treasure is there, our heart will be also. So what a great example we see in the wisdom of the ant. Number two, the second is the rock badger. Look at verse 26. It says the rock badger, or the hyrax, or the coney, are feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags, in the cracks of the rocks, we might say. Now these rock badgers, or the conies, also referred to as hyrax, we often see them uh, when we are in Israel, when we're down at En Gedi, the spring of the wild goat. These conies, they look like little bunny rabbits. They're very feeble. They, they can't defend themselves, except they have no ears, interestingly enough. They're funny looking little creatures. Uh, and this is where David hid out. He had ice cold flowing water, living water out in the desert. Little conies, conies on a stick, barbecued them, no doubt. I mean, they're probably pretty tasty. I've never eaten one, but uh, David no doubt did. But they can't defend themselves, yet they're wise enough. They hide themselves in the crag, in the crevices of the rock, and they're virtually invisible. In fact, remember when we were walking up those rocks? Oh, there's a coney. Where? I don't see him. I don't see him. Oh, he's blended in. He's stuck right. I, they're, 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 they're amazing. And boy, what a picture that paints for us. Because we're pretty feeble too. Hello? <laughs> we're flesh and blood. I mean, look, cars, other things are a lot stronger than we are. We're pretty feeble in, in, in the scope of things. So the wisest thing we can do is like the coney, hide in the rock. In other words, hide in Christ. Our, our hiding place is Christ because Christ is our rock. Number three, the third little thing that's wise are the locusts, verse 27. It says, the locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. When locusts swarm, nobody leads them, but they fly as a group. They're wise enough to travel together. They work together. And boy, what a picture that paints of the body of Christ, how it should be as well. And number four and finally is the spider. The spider, look at verse 28. It says, the spider skillfully grasps with its hands. And it is in king's palaces. Now, this particular word spider could also carry the idea of something that's poisonous. It is also translated lizard in some translations. So spiders don't necessarily have hands that grab, but lizards do. Uh, geckos. I mean, we see them. They grab and, and they climb up ceilings. It's crazy. Uh, they, li they live in very expensive hotels in Hawaii. You know what I'm saying? Geckos are everywhere. And so they live in king's palaces, we might say. So they're wise enough to live in the king's palace. And what a great picture that paints for us. Because we can live, <laughs> we can live on the side of the road or we can live in the king's palace. We can live in the mansion that God will provide for us in heaven. What a beautiful thing. Well, number nine, real quickly. The ninth issue deals with things that are majestic. In verses 29 through 31, things that are majestic. Look at verse 29. It says, these are three things which are majestic in pace, yes, four which are stately in walk. 
Number one is the lion, verse 30. It says, a lion which is mighty among beasts and does not turn away from any. Man, the lion struts through the tall grass, not afraid of anything or anyone. Very majestic. Number two is the greyhound, verse 31. It says, a, a greyhound. Now, the greyhound has long, slender legs, very tall, very stately, we might say. The third is a goat. Look at verse 31 again. It says a male goat also. You say, Clark, a male goat, majestic, stately. Are you kidding me? It's a goat. It eats trash. Listen, when we're in En Gedi, we see those goats that are climbing up the side of those cliffs. Man, they are amazing. Talk about majestic. They've got those horns. They're standing up on the side of the cliff like, what, you want some of this? <laughs> I mean, they're amazing to view. And so the male goat, when we talk about the goats, we're not talking about silly little billy goats that chew grass, man. We're talking about these goats down in, in Gedi. And Lord willing, we'll see them in about four weeks when we're in Israel. Many of you are going, I know. Number four. The fourth thing involves kings with troops, verse 31. It says, and a king whose troops are with him. Speaks of total confidence as the king has his army going before him. It speaks of victory. And boy, what a beautiful picture this should paint of each and every one of us of our life in Jesus Christ. Because in, through, and because of Christ, we're bold. We are afraid of nothing. We can leap tall. Oh, no, that's the other guy. We... we, uh, we <laughs> We can have absolute victory. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Paul said, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful picture that paints. Well, number 10 and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. Don't exalt yourself. Don't exalt yourself. That's in verses 32 and 33. Take a look. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 32. If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, put your hand on your mouth. For as the churning of butter produces milk, as the wringing the nose produces blood, so the force of wrath produces strife. Man, don't devise evil things. Don't exalt yourself. It leads to wrath, strife, and destruction. You know, in 1 Peter 5, 6, Peter said that we should humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Same thing in James chapter 4, verse 6. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. And Lord, we thank You for these very simple but very practical lessons from Your Word. And Lord, we pray that as we... Uh, Maybe just spend some time in the next few days reviewing and rereading <laughs> this chapter and maybe focusing on a couple of the verses that really minister to hearts and speak <laughs> of the importance in our lives to put it into practice, Lord, that uh, truly it would be a time of refreshing and a time of growing, a time of realizing, Lord, that, uh, Lord, apart from you, <laughs> we're nothing. But in, through, and because of you, Lord, we're everything. We're more than conquerors. We recognize and realize, Lord, as your word tells us in Philippians 4.13, that we can do all things through you because you are strengthening us. So, Lord, let that be the case, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors and the brothers and the sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you. And gals, don't forget, uh, tomorrow the women's ministry is back in full swing in the book of Ephesians. You still in chapter 5? <laughs> chapter 5, it's a heavy one. It's a good one. You don't want to miss that. That'll be tomorrow at 9.15 in the morning and uh, 6.30 Thursday night. So. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, a great rest of the week in Jesus. Caprice, I love you. You know that. You're so stinking cute. She's so sweet.